Hello, my name is Cynthia Alice Anderson, and I'm the owner and founder of the Experience of the Soul podcast channel. We are now completing three years of being on the air, and I wanted to personally thank you for all of your support. As a listener, as you share the podcast on your social media pages, and for your financial support. We would not be where we are today without this amazing support, which is in over 80 countries and 150,000 downloads worldwide. So I thank you, dear friend. I'm grateful we get to walk this journey together. And I cannot wait to see what we're able to do in another three years. Thank you again, dear friend, and blessings on the journey. Support Tech Staffing presents The Authentic Spiritual Journey, a weekly show featuring real and practical spiritual conversations from diverse perspectives here on the Experience of the Soul podcast channel. Today, episode 164, award-winning writer and producer, Gregory O'Connor. And now your host, Reverend Cynthia Alice Anderson. Hello and welcome to the Authentic Spiritual Journey. My name is Cynthia Alice Anderson. I'm in the I am the host, and I'm here in 818 Studios with my producer. Hello, everybody. This is Dave Croft. Thank you so much for joining us for episode 164 of the Authentic Spiritual Journey. I hope that you are having an amazing, an amazing summer. It's hard to believe we're we're here in August, but uh, but here we are, and so happy to have you with us today. Yes, thank you, friends, for joining us. We love to be the first ones to welcome you into your week and bless you. And thank you for your love, for your support. And, you know, we are in over 80 countries now, so we thank you for uh, listening from all over the world. And today is a very special day because we have a guest with us. I'm really happy, proud, and excited to be bringing. His name is uh, Gregory O'Connor, and Greg is a uh, producer and a writer. And uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to meet Greg very recently, and I, I when once I heard him speak, I said, I really want him on the show. So, uh, Greg, thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. Thank you for having me, Cynthia Ellis. Uh, well, you're so welcome. We're honored and uh, I feel like I want to give some context uh, to to our meeting because uh, I take some courses at a CC Institute, and uh, you came to one of our classes. We'd studied a move, one of your movies called Pride and Glory, and now since I have to say I've fallen in love with your work, and uh, I knew of that movie. I think I saw it when it first came out, but to study the movie to look at the archetypal figures and uh, to observe their journey was really special. And um, on our show, you know, what we tend to do is the show is really to help people grow, prosper, and evolve, right? We are souls on a spiritual journey and we're all human. And so we find that in our humanness, um, we can also find this, this, um, these moments, these situations, you know, that guide our journey. And uh, I, I, I see that in your movies. I see the depth of the characters. I see the depth of uh, uh, also the male characters. So I just, I want people to know about your work. And I'm also keenly interested in your uh, spiritual journey as well. So, uh, so first of all, uh, I'd love for you to tell our listeners just a little bit about what you've been doing uh, career-wise, you know, you're producing, you're writing, so they get to know you a little bit in some of your, uh, some of your uh, work. No, absolutely. I, maybe the best thing is just to tell you a little, just a little bit of background. So uh, sort of how yeah. I got into being, because I'm from New York. My father mm-hmm. was a New York City police officer. My brother and I have sort of no connection at all to the, you know, the film business other than my father taking us to movies and being sort of a, uh, an avid yeah film lover, I guess, um, as, as kids, surprisingly for somebody who was a New York city cop, he had kind of a sort of a refined taste for film, interestingly. Um, and, um, so I, my brother and I both went to the same college actually in Philadelphia university of Pennsylvania. And, um, when we came out, I went into a family business and my mm-hmm. brother was a writer and an actor, and he was, you know, in New York, we were back in New York City and uh, living, both of us living in the city. And he was working 
um, really just on his craft, I guess you'd say. He went. He was, you know, always going to acting classes, and he, I really thought that his interest and his passion was in acting. Um, mm-hmm. But as time went on, and this is probably over. I'm going to say, you know, six or seven years or something like that. He started writing more, um, and his name is Gavin O'Connor. And he uh, he asked me to sort of help him with his theater projects. We were, we would put on these little black box theater in New York City, you know, the kind of thing that like five people come to, and it's mostly your family. <laughs> and, um, but but you know, he would write them and be in them, and they were actually very good. Like I was impressed. And then we made a short film, and that short film went around kind of the film festival circuit. Um, and, and surprisingly did very well. And so it was coming off of that, that my brother wrote with his then wife, uh, named Angela Shelton. They wrote a story that was based on a, um, a kind of, a um, a sort of, a, sort of herb diaries, I guess you'd say from the time she was probably seven to 17, um, and she lived this kind of very sort of nomadic, interesting life. She, she and her mother traveled back and forth, forth across the country. Her mom was married six times. Um, and she was kind of this little girl that had to sort of endure all the, you know, immersion, emotional turmoil that was in, involved with that. Anyway, what, what they did was they turned it into a story about a mother and daughter, the daughter being 12 going on 13. So it's just sort of the cusp of, you know, going from a girl to a woman and it was really a story about how the girl was really the mother in the relationship and the mother was the daughter in the relationship on that. And so basically what happened was we, they wrote this script. I thought it was really, really good. Um, and really having never done anything like this, we put together a um, kind of a little package and um, we found an actress and it was a British stage actress. And I'll always remember this because we saw her on the Charlie Rose show. I don't know if you guys remember the Charlie Rose show, but I, we were obsessed with Charlie Rose. Um, and this woman who had just done a show called the doll's house, a doll's house, the Ibsen play in New York on, on, um, on, uh, on Broadway. Mm-hmm. Um, and New York times, Ben Bradley said, this is the greatest performance I've ever seen. She actually won the Tony. Her, um, her name is Janet McTeer. And we went to the theater and we sent her, we, we dropped off the script and to our surprise, she said she would be interested in doing it. And she was playing kind of like a North Carolina, you know, working class North Carolina. This is a sort of a British, you know, Royal Academy actress. Um, anyway, she committed to it. We tried to get it funded through the normal, you know, channels of, you know, the kind of indie film studios. Everybody said, I, we always say the best answer we got was no. Mostly we got, we just got ignored. <laughs> Those things. So we, we just decided, and we had this lawyer who's kind of like a, you know, independent film lawyer. We had like a two and a half million dollar budget. And, um, we basically went to the lawyer and said, look, we're going to do this for $600,000. And at that time, which was 1999, mm-hmm. 98, 99, at that time, $600,000, you can actually do a lot more for $600,000 these days than you could then because you were shooting on 35 film, millimeter film mm-hmm. and editing on film. Let's say stuff. Anyway, long story short, everybody said you can't do that. Um, we said we're doing it. We, we literally drove out to California. And um, we hired this lovely, what they call a line producer, who was, some, you know, in our case, was somebody who knows how to make a movie, which we didn't. <laughs> and um, and we, we, you know, we put together this like, you know, rough and tumble crew and a, sort of this ragtag little, tag little circus of a, of a, and we made this tiny little movie by ourselves out of the desert. And, you know, this whole thing it was about this story about this mother and daughter driving cross country back and forth between North Carolina and um, San Diego area, which is really what the, you know, the main journey of these two people is about. Uh, anyway, long story short, we, we, we submitted that into Sundance and we, to our utter surprise, got into the Sundance film festival, um, which at that time was a huge deal still is, but at that time, you know, the, the market for these things was very limited, you know, we got into the Sundance film festival and the woman who was the actress was so good. And because she was sort of this acclaimed stage actress, um, the New York Daily News, I think, did a Sundance edition and said, give this woman an Oscar. 
That was the headline. And from that, there was a bidding war. And we, we ended up selling this tiny little movie to New Line Cinema. They had a kind of an indie arm, which is called Fine Line at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and they locked us in a room and they bought this little movie that we made. And that was what really launched us. It didn't really do so great in the theater. I mean, I, I don't know. They just didn't release it that well or whatever, whatever happened to it. But it did OK. But I think it's a beautiful, tiny little kind of gem of a, a story. And interestingly enough, given the rest of the work that we've primarily done, it was about a mother and a daughter. Since then, we've done more masculine kind of out of movies. Yeah. But yeah. that's really what happened. And from there, we, we made a deal with New Line, which is part of Warner, um, Warner Brothers. And um, we uh, we ended up um, doing there's the movie that you saw, Pride and Glory. There was actually a round one of Pride and Glory where New Line was only going to do. I guess they didn't trust us with twenty five million dollars after we only made a six hundred thousand dollar movie. <laughs> so <laughs> they they decided, well, we're not going to fund this movie, but we'll release it. We'll do the distribution, and we went and got a. Um, internet, and with their help, we got an a, 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 a international financing company out of Germany, which was called Intermedia at the time. And we were going and making this movie with Intermedia. It was $25 million, new line doing the distribution. Um, and then it kind of imploded. Uh, Intermedia somehow, some they had some scandal or something like that. They kind of lost their money. And we were in pre-production. Actually, Hugh Jackman was the role that ultimately was Ed Norton, but in the time it was Hugh Jackman. Oh, wow. And um, I'm trying to think who else we are. We, I think we were, I know we, we spoke to everybody. We talked to Johnny Depp. We spoke to um, Mark Wahlberg. I think that maybe Mark Wahlberg was maybe, I can't even remember now, but, but my brother was literally doing what they call like drive alongs with the New York city police where they were sitting in the back seat and these New York city police officers would take them, on their tour at night, it was mostly at night, and these guys would sit in the back and just kind of observe. And it was a way for them to really get a sense of what the world was like. Even though my dad was a cop, we weren't. So it's still like I was around and I brought up was brought up around a lot. Um, anyway, so that was our next movie, and then it imploded. And I, I remember literally calling my brother, and he was out with these doing this ride along, and. I was living downtown in New York City in Tribeca, and this car, this police car pulls up, and my brother and Hugh Jackman come out, and I literally had to tell them the bad news. The movie was done. And we had all, like, you know, our whole next year plus was all, you know, making this movie. I, I'm sure that Hugh got a, some payment because you, you, you have to give what they call a pay or play. You got to pay people. That's more detail that you probably need to know. But, um, but we, for for some period of time, were like, now what do we do? Like, we don't know anything about this business. We somehow got these guys to make to give us twenty five million dollars to make this story, and um, and um, I guess it was probably like a month later. We had agent. We had agents out in Los Angeles. We were living in New York. About a month later, they called us and said, "There's a movie that Disney has that they would be interested in you guys doing." Um, and um, so it, and it was a sports story because my brother and I both athletes and both played sports in college. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway, anyway, it ended up being a movie called Miracle, which is about the 1980 Olympic hockey team with um, at the time there was no cast involved. But we read the script. I actually didn't not that I didn't love it. I thought it was it was very fine, but I'm not a hockey fan. So it really wasn't like appealing to me, honestly, quite honestly. But I think. For my brother and um, and myself, without sort of any other options, we decided to to take that, and we ended up making that, and that was ended up being our next movie, and then we came back around and did Pride and Glory. Of course, that was like a much bigger budget movie, so now they trusted us. I get that that kind of cleared the path for us to do our our you know our personal story, our cop movie, and that's kind of how we got there. That's a long well, story. Yeah, so sorry about that. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love you're a writer. You've got stuff to say, right? Yeah. Well, well, I love that. You know, there were some great actors in that movie. There was Colin Farrell. There was Ed Norton. There was John Voight. You know, right. I mean, it it was a great cast. And what I've noticed is after you made that movie, you know, people keep copying that theme. 
So, uh, you know, uh, it's a theme that's now known in cop movies. What was that? Uh, the show, um, there's a show now on like Blue Bloods. Blue to Bloods me, it's, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, but, you know, I want to just lift up a couple things you said, if you don't mind, which is that of course. Uh, when you said the best answer we got was no, you know, I could just we I could, you know, do a whole course on that one statement. Uh, the best answer we got was no, because I think in life, sometimes we look at no's as some a no as some kind of failure. But the truth is, it's helpful because we go, OK, so it's not that door it's this door, you know, it's, it's this way. And so, uh, I love the way you frame that in your journey, uh, because, uh, a clear no is, um, is, is a yes in another direction. Right. And yeah, so I right. love the way you, you frame that aspect and I also loved hearing that, you know, it's not like you woke up one day and said, I'm going to make it big in the movies. You just, uh, you know, kind of followed the energy of what of what life was bringing. And uh, this is something that I think is very valuable for us to hear. I, I think sometimes we think there's some big thing we're supposed to be doing. And it's like, uh, if we listen, if we're tuned in, if we are open and available, you know, life sends what we're ready to receive. And, uh, I, I like all of that about, about that story you shared. I'm really glad you shared it. And I also want to mention, uh, friends to our listeners, if you haven't seen Pride and Glory, I want to encourage you to see it. And the other one I just saw that just knocked me out in a di completely different way was the movie Warrior. Oh my goodness. And I found both those, I think on Amazon Prime is the best place to find those movies. But, uh, very, very good movie. And as you said, Greg, it's it's actually, you would think, mostly masculine because it's uh, MMA fighting, uh, the movie is about. But the but the characters and the way you work with, really, you were working the whole, whole film with the warrior archetype, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that had to be conscious on the part of the writers and the producers. So can you say a little bit about that? Well, it's interesting. I, I first of all, I want to just respond to what you said about the no, because I think oh, that um, I think that um, you know we can't. And it's not, I, I say this; it's easier in retrospect. It's harder when you get a no, because no is always feels like rejection, right? Totally, but totally. A no isn't a rejection. It's it's just an opportunity to go down a different path and um or to find a different like-minded partner depending on what that is you're you're doing and i think um you know perseverance and and just following your heart and not listening to the nose as a as uh something negative um it may inform if you get if you get a no that and and the reasons, if you can get a reason, which is hard sometimes, it's tend to mm. be there's some some sense similar thematically. Then maybe it's an and it's an opportunity to go. Okay, let me. What is it that I'm hearing from people, and how can I adjust what I'm doing? Um, but you still have to at the same time listen to your heart. So it's not a it's not a you know it's not a black and white thing. But I do think I love what you said that it is just no is not a. Um, it's not something that should stop us. It's something that just allows us to go down a different, a different path. Yes. I, right. I think if we can frame the no as, you know, if we just don't take it on as like, then uh, we don't make it mean something about our value. I, and that's right. I think that's, that's, I think that's what we tend to do. We tend to over personalize the no and, and what that may mean. And, and sometimes, like you say, uh, a no can be very illuminating. And sometimes we need that illuminating. Sometimes we need a waking up to move a different direction. And, you know, I honestly believe that everything ultimately is working on our behalf. And I think sometimes we have to dig deep to find what that is. We have to listen most definitely to the heart and soul of us. And, uh, and it can be, you know, a multi-layered process, uh, yeah. uh, depending on how how attached, you know, we may be about a certain direction or any given. Well, I given think process. attached is a great is a great way to say it because I think if you're not attached, so the whole idea of being not attached, then I think you try to listen to what that voice is telling you. Yes. I'm not attached yeah. to the to it being a certain way, but 
that voice is telling me that this is right, you know? And even though I'm getting no's, there's something, I'm not saying I want it my way or the highway because I'm attached to this, but I, but my heart is telling me this is the right way to go. I've gotten so many no's that I still felt like, you know what, even though I'm getting no's, I think this is, I just, my heart is telling me this is the right thing or my gut or whatever you want to call it. It's telling sure. me this is the right sure. thing. So it's kind of like, um, I guess being, you know, raising your consciousness in a way so that you can be clear about, are you, are you just being stubborn and not listening to what people are saying? Or are you completely going to allow yourself to be unattached to the results and what people are saying and, and listen to what your gut is telling you? And, you know, again, this is not black and white, but I think that's the, that's the trick is to try and find that, you know? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. And so going back to warrior, I think, um, from a, from a creative standpoint, um, cause I know Michael Conforti from the CC Institute is actually my cousin. That's why I got involved with the CC. And, um, he, he's very interested in story and the, and the sort of hero's journey and all that kind of stuff. Um, he asked me this question all the time, even about themes or whatever. A lot of times you, you, you're not necessarily like thinking about it. It's not in your head so much mm-hmm. like it's not an intellectual exercise oh i'm going to sort of play with the the warrior archetype that warrior archetype i think is in an artist is sort of like all of those architects ar- archetypes are somewhere in us or out there somewhere and it's up to kind of to kind of tap into that and i think it's more of a a creative unconscious process than it is kind of a conscious sort of like saying we want to sort of play with this warrior archetype or what is it i don't think we ever thought about the warrior archetype when we were writing that um Mm -hmm. or making it but but somehow you know that there's something in that 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 is like coming to you something about the power of that warrior archetype and what it means and what it stands for and it's kind of an instinctual thing so i think you know in the stories that we tell that that tends to be the way that i uh, approach it um and um and and being part of a writing process where even i'm not necessarily the writer um, but as a producer, you tend to be overseeing and very involved in the creative conceptualization and, and development of it. Um, so you're very involved in the in the discussion about the story and where it's going and the beats and oftentimes all that kind of stuff. You you know kind of talking about the beats of the story. Um, it, it's very rare that there there's kind of that kind of intellectual conversation about about those things. It's it's just more of an you know, kind of an innate thing that you're you're looking for. Um, very. Mm-hmm. That's my experience anyway. Yeah, no, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to go ahead and take a short break. We uh, have wonderful sponsors, so we're, we'll be right back uh, after these brief messages. We'll return to the program in just a few moments. But first, we wanted to give a special word of thanks to our podcast partners, Support Tech Staffing. Support Tech Staffing is an innovative staffing agency built on the principle of caring about employers and employees as they navigate these new workforce and workplace challenges. If you're an employer, they want to be your human resource partner and help with the changes needed during the pandemic. If you're a candidate, they want to become your lifelong career agent to help you grow into your fullest potential. Support Tech prioritizes support over volume, integrity over profits, and will treat your business and your career as if it was their own. You can learn more at supporttechstaffing.com. That's S-U-P-P-O-R-T-E-K staffing.com. We now return you to this week's episode of The Authentic Spiritual Journey with your host, Reverend Cynthia Alice Anderson. Welcome back, friends. I know uh, those of you listening are uh, are really taking this in, what Greg is saying. And, you know, I keep circling back, Greg, to many things that you said. Um, I, I'm still on the first thing with the no thing. <laughs> About the best answer is no. And I'm also, uh, keep what keeps coming up in t- speaking with you, and even at the break, I was talking about sharing the movie with friends. Uh, what so touched me about the Warrior movie, I just felt like I wanted to mention it to our listeners, um, is that the 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 male characters had more than one emotion and uh what what I want to say about that is it's interesting because in my work I tend to attract even though I do uh you know spiritual work and people tend to think that's more women or more uh headed in that direction you know yes, more feminine energy it is more self-awareness yeah. 
But for some reason, I tend to work with a lot of men. And and one of the reasons I enjoy it is that men learn they have more than one emotion, that there's that there's sadness, there's grief. And even if most of their lives, those those uh, uh, emotions have been, um, for lack of a better word, like truncated in them, that, uh, you know, when I have the pleasure of seeing them open and grow and their soul begin to express, you know, on a more a dynamic level, I can't tell you how rewarding it is for me. Um, as a spiritual teacher, to be able to see that. Well, in your movie, that was present. And it's it's missing in so many of today's movies. I mean, you know, everything is so two-dimensional. There's There's no depth. And what I loved about all the characters in the movie is that there was a depth in who they were. And, you know, as, as, uh, as human beings, we're, we're multifaceted, you know, we're not just a fighter or just a husband or just a wife. We are human and we are spiritual and we love and we grieve and we don't want to love and grieve. And, and the, the tender moments of the, of the sons, you know, with the dad uh, who uh, played by Nick Nolte, who I actually I really like Nick Nolte as well. Uh, it was such a tender scene, and I thought ev- I wish every man could see this scene, because uh, even though there was so much, uh, uh, you know, hurt from from years gone past, there was like this moments of connection and compassion that was just full of love. So I, I, it's yeah. Been, yeah, it's a beautiful scene. Um, it, you know, it's funny talking about the no thing. We we making the movie Warrior. We got uh, the the way that this film got made was we went out to um, all the buyers. Uh, this was done with. Um, so we developed that at New Line, um, but then New Line got merged into Warner Brothers. Whatever they they weren't going to make it. And we wanted to make it next. So it's not that they weren't going to do it, but they said, we just can't do it right now. So we said, can we take it out? Can we shop it? And we, through our agents, we took it out to sort of the, all the buyers, the major studios and whatever. And we got no's from everybody except for one. Um, and it's just a great example how you only need one, you know. Um, but if we didn't get that one, you know, our reaction would have been that nobody likes this, you know. And um, and it was the one company that said yes. And, and ultimately I think that, you know, I'm so happy that they did because we, it ended up being something I'm super proud of. And a lot of people really do respond in a similar way. It's about, it's mixed martial arts and fighting and all that kind of stuff is the background. It is about, it's really just about being human and about being flawed and about how families can be torn apart and, and how that can hurt us, but that we need somehow need to redeem our, ourselves. And, and so I think those are, those are, kind of themes that we like to play with. We love family stories. You, you, you can see that there's a lot of father, son stuff um, and uh, brothers and fathers, you know, that tends to be a lot of the things that we deal with, but we want to do it in a way that doesn't feel like sort of surfacey macho. There, there, there needs to be like a real kind of underlying heartbeat to the, to the story and real emotion and, and, uh, and people kind of wrestling with, their flaws and and um i think especially men who maybe have a lot harder time being emotional and sharing their emotions to sort of how how we can get that stuff to come through um and feel you know have so so it's palpable without having to say a lot and i think that's kind of really interesting in telling you know stories that are very masculine on the face of it you know yeah, most definitely. And I did notice your brother uh, also was in the film. And so, yeah, I wondered what that was like, because there uh, in in both Pride and Glory and Warrior, you know, there there were opportunities for redemption. You know, there were de- redemptive aspects. And I don't want to, you know, wreck the end of the film, so I won't say anything. But uh, <laughs> I, I really loved uh, the there were many opportunities for redemption. And I I just think as humans, uh, you know, there are times we need to give each other grace. And I also love that uh, the other son, I'm spacing on his name right now in the movie, um, but uh, I I loved his boundary around family. And it's like, no, you hurt me. No, you stay here. And no, this is the life I've chosen. Uh, So there was so much heart in the movie, but ultimately the... the, um, 
the caring, the love, the redemption um, for me was really important in this story. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's what, you know, we wanted to come through and I'm happy that it, it mm-hmm. did. Yeah. The other character. Uh, so Tom Hardy played the Tommy character and the other, yeah. the other brother was Joel Egerton, who's a great actor, yeah. Australian actor. Um, he's actually in this, this series that's out right now based on that, uh, the book, the underground railroad. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's, it's gotten a lot of, um, acclaim. Um, and, uh, Joel is a, is a, you know, one of the lead characters that he's a great actor. So I think that's part of it also having great actors, you know, you, you can write, you know, you can write something, you want it to come through, but you've got to have those. They're like our medium. They've got to, they've got to take those words and somehow, make that come through them. And I, you know, I, I, I have so much respect for people who, who are able to do that. Um, and you were mentioning my brother being in it. I mean, he had a small role, but I had to force him to do that because he really, when, as I was saying, when we started off, that's what he was. He was an actor. And I thought that's the, you know, I thought he's just not really, ha- ha- he didn't really want to act anymore. He was in the first little movie, Tumbleweeds. He had a kind of a smaller role, which I thought was very smart. He gave himself a small role and he played the bad guy and he did it really well. Um, and, um, he didn't want to do anything in Pride and Glory. And then when some, I'm trying to remember who the actor was. We had somebody who dropped out in that role. And then I just said, we were looking for somebody else. And I said, why don't you play it? He's like, I don't want to do that. I said, just do it. And he finally did. So I wish he would do it more. He's very good. Yeah. I thought it was very, very good. Well, what, what I also am interested in is, you know, your spiritual journey, because, you know, as much as our careers are reflective of our journey, um, I know that there's uh, there has to be time where you're quiet, where you meditate. Like, what what is helping you get mm. through the day right now? Yeah. What, what what's your process? Well, you know, it's interesting because we are in a business that um, it's not like a typical job or a different a, tip- a typical you know, kind of career where it's something that's steady. You, you have a movie and then, you know, the example I always use is I've got a, you know, I, I start a restaurant. It's really successful. Everybody loves it and wants to come to it. And at the end of the year, I got to close it down and I got to start a new one. And I don't know if the next one I got, it's going to be completely different. And I just don't know if the next one's going to be, you know, people are going to like it or, or whatever. I, I, it's, it's, it can be very, it can be very stressful in that sense. You don't know when your next project is going to be. So it's for my, I guess my journey has been to more, more from being a, um, a producer, um, you know, more of the business side of it to being much more of a creator and much more of an artist. And I went from, you know, being kind of the business person to the person that was sort of like developing our ideas and stories and working with the writers to then um, almost out of necessity in a way and interest um, just writing or co-writing things myself. And so it's been an interesting kind of like journey to go from kind of like the head to the more artistic, um, you know, spiritual side, I guess, because I think, you know, I think to, to be a writer, um, I think you have to tap into something that's that's different than you would. It's just not it's not your head. It's your it's your sort of right brain, I guess. Um, so um, that's really been my my journey. And and uh, it you know you talk about meditation. I think I said this at the uh, at the Assisi Institute seminar. Like when I write something, um, I feel like the I never really feel like anything that I've written or certainly anything that I think is any good has come from me. I feel like it's come through me. So I tend to, um, I started off doing it really as a writer, more of kind of the meditation. And now that's kind of been, that has become a big part of my life. I meditate. Uh I try to, you know, ask the universe to, you know, to come through me to, you know, whatever I'm, you know, all the things that I want, I want to have grace. Of course I want, um, I want to uh, have gratitude. I want the people who I, you know, I, I'm working with, or or certainly my family and people I love to, to, um, you know, I'm always asking the universe to sort of like take care of them. I, um, I, so that really started off as kind of my, my creative process, but it's sort of taken over kind of all aspects of my life. And, and when I write something or I'm working on something creative or now even not creative, 
um, I'll usually do a meditation and just kind of like try to open myself up so that some kind of, you know, I think that like you're saying, it's like all the information is out there. You know, I just need to have it kind of come through me. And so I feel like whenever I've done something well, um, it's been it's been that. And I feel like that's been the best way for me to feel like I can actually write something or do something um, is by, you know, sort of reaching for a sort of a higher power to help me <laughs> do that, because I don't know that I could do it all myself. So. Yeah. Yes, I think you're saying some really important things, and it's a theme we tend to return to over and over that, you know, there is this divine energy, and, you know, yes, it's universe, it's life itself, and uh, the idea is that, um, you know, that we often discuss is that, you know, sometimes our personality self, that self that gets, you know, created out of <laughs> trying to receive love, uh, that, that that personality self is is oftentimes uh, very limited because mm. it's trying to convince and control what happens. But there's this, you know, this more expansive grand part of us, you know, that we believe lives at the level of the soul. And uh, this is what we seek to live from. And so we often call it, you know, doing our soul work, which is, as you say, being in gratitude, like doing something so simple as every morning setting an intention for to, for your day, you know, yes. to to just intend that that you're in a dynamic relationship with the universe, you know, with all that is. And, and my, you know, just in my own work, it, I, I'm convinced that the universe cares very deeply about what happens to us and how engaged um, we are with life. And so uh, when I, when I heard you, you know, share before with Assisi, I said, I, I'd like to hear more about that because this is what we always come back to that is our work. It's like every day to recenter, to become still, to be in gratitude, to set our intention and then open to receive. I mean, that is the work. That yes. is the work of the soul. And so I think as we do that, those pieces of personality kind of get um, obliterated by the light. You know, it's like it's still there, but but that light is is there and informing and... You well, know, arguably supporting. even more, the you is the it's more the true essence of you because I think a lot of the well, as you were yeah. saying, that other that 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 you is you know it's shaped by all these other kind of outside forces and things that we feel like we need to control or things that we think we need to be or you know certain uh, you know um, external you know things that we believe we need to show whatever. Um, so I I really do believe in it and I think that is a practice because if you think that you know, you can kind of like say a prayer and, and do a meditation for a couple of days. And then it's all like things. It, it is not that. And it's not that easy. I think that this is it's a life's work. And I'm not going to tell you that there have been times where I totally question it. I go, I don't know if I believe any of this. You know, I, I've literally said that a number of times because I feel like I'm like to really try to be the best that I can be or whatever. And I, you know, I sort of try to, you know, just pray for things, but I also not like control it and just let it like, let the universe take me where it wants to take me. And I'm kind of going, if this is where the universe wants to take me, either there's something I don't understand, or this is not working, you know, and I've had that happen to me many times, but, you know, maybe out of a place of, um, you know, what other choice do I have? I'm going to just keep on, you know, it is a practice and it's probably going to be till I'm, you know, 90 years old, I'm going to have to keep, you know, staying in that place, continuing to give over, you know, give, you know, give over, give over control. The older I get, the more I realize I have less control, you know, the less control I really think I have. Um, so, and I think if you accept that and you just, you know, just be the best you can be, um, have an intention um, and just do the best you can. I think that's all that's all we can do. And it takes some like control kind of sucks also. You know, if you feel like you want to control everything, it's not a fun, enjoyable, beautiful way to live. Like if you can let go of that and just go, I'm going to just put it in the universe's hands. I mean, I'm going to do everything I can. It's not like I'm going to wash my hands of it and just go, whatever happens, happens. You've still got to take actions, you know, but if it's not coming from a place of me trying to control everything, just do the best you can. This is what I'd like to accomplish. This is what I want to do with my life. This is what I want to do today, whatever it is. 
you know, so that's what I try to do. It's never, it's never not always easy, but that I do believe in that. I do believe as a, as a creator, I find that I get the best results when I just kind of like, you know, let the, whatever is supposed to come through me, come through me. And, and, um, and so, yeah, so that and meditation and trying to be conscious and trying to let go of control and all that kind of stuff. It's been, a, I, I feel like I've come a long way and I've got a long way to go. Um, but it's, it's been a really, really important part of my journey for sure. Yes. I mean, I think you said some important things. Yeah. We're all in this journey we call life and every day, every moment, you know, it's a moment by moment process. Are we going to wake up? Or are we going to go back into delusion? You know, that's, that's, yeah. that's really the question. Are we going to be centered in the personality self? Or are we going to go, you know, go with spirit, go with God, go with soul? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I can't believe we're almost uh, to the end of our time together. I could I could talk to you forever. Uh, I wanted to ask you, though, uh, I know you have some projects coming up. Is there anything you want to let our listeners know about? Because I was kind of excited when you told us about it before, right before we went on the air. Yes, yes. So um, the uh, I, w one project we have coming up, which is in Northern Ireland, it's also a story about brothers. Um, it's based on a documentary called Road. I recommend it to, uh, to everybody. It's a BBC documentary and it's about these Dunlop, um, they're motorcycle racers. Um, and it's about a pair, it's about a brother. It's a brother story about these motorcycle racers. And it's based on this documentary. I'm really, really excited about that. We're going to shoot that in Northern Ireland next, um, probably around this time next year. Um, and, um, and then we, my, my writing partner and I wrote a podcast series, an audio drama, um, that we're doing with Audible, and it's called The Space Within. Um, and The Space Within um, is, the very, very brief explanation is that it is, um, it's inspired by, loosely based on, but definitely inspired by the life of a, of a, um, a well-known psychoanalyst named John Mack. Um, and John Mack in the, in the 70s, I think, was a very, very highly regarded Harvard psychologist um who kind of gave up his career in a way to study um people who believed that they were abducted by aliens um yeah. and so yeah. what we did was we took this idea um and we made this character um her name is maddie weil and we fictionalize it and, and she is this very similar story and it's about how she gets a patient She's much more kind of science oriented and she gets this patient and this patient doesn't remember what happened. They were abducted. They were missing for like seven hours. They don't really know what happened. Um, and it's a little girl and we just follow the story. And then there's another one. And then she starts to believe that maybe there's something more to it. And what I love about the story and I love about John Mack because he actually wrote a book is he never says that he necessarily believes he, he never concretizes what alien means. He He's saying that there's an experience that these people are having um, that he believes is true, but that it it's almost like a from a Jungian perspective where it's some it has some connection to the universe in a way that maybe we don't understand in in the you know in the sort of scientific sense of the word. Um, and so that's kind of what we're playing with. We're playing with the sort of these experience that these peoples have had these abductions. Um, and then what happens to them? And, and basically the way that the story sort of plays out is that these people start having, you know, the, their lives starting to transform. They have these kind of transformative experiences, um, mostly positive. The little girl was on the spectrum. Um, and she starts to have this sort of incredible ability, sort of mental powers, um, but it's handed in a very sophisticated way. I, I'm, I'm really, really, really happy with it. So we're we're just casting it right now. Um, I think we're gonna have a really, really great cast, and um, we're doing season one. We should be recording it shortly, um, and uh, should come out uh, this year in 2021. Um, and then, you know, I guess if everything goes well, then there'll be there's there's supposed to be three seasons of it. So that's something I'm really. I'm really proud of. I wrote it with a partner of mine named Josh Fagan, who's a great writer. Um, and uh, again, it's called The Space Within, something I'm really, really excited about. 
Thank you so much, Greg. And again, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you've been traveling and all over the world recently. So uh, you taking the time uh, in the midst of all of that and all these big projects to talk to us means the world to us. And of course, we're here to help and support you as well. So I know our listeners are going to be checking out and looking for your new projects. Again, we are all over the world. And we thank all of our listeners too for for stopping in with us today. And uh, friends, as always, our goal is to support you on your journey. We see you blessed. We see you loved. We see you lifted up. And our prayer for you always is that you grow, that you prosper, that you evolve. So blessings on the journey, dear friends, and we'll see you next week. We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of The Authentic Spiritual Journey presented by Support Tech Staffing. This channel is also made possible because of listeners just like you. If you would like to support the channel with your tax-deductible contribution on an ongoing basis or through a one-time gift, head over to experienceofthesoul.com slash support. The Authentic Spiritual Journey is copyright 2021, Cynthia Alice Anderson, all rights reserved. Our theme music is composed by Dave Croft and used with permission from RR Hot Publishing. The Experience of the Soul podcast channel is a production of 818 Studios.